Hey guys, hope you're all doing well. Now for today's video, I wanted to go into full-on spoiler territory with my thoughts on Season 2 of Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous. For those of you who want to hear what I have to say without getting any spoilers, be sure to check out my non-spoiler review that I just happened to put up yesterday. Now, when it comes to Season 2 of Camp Cretaceous, we learned a whole ton of new stuff about Jurassic World that we really hadn't ever gotten info on before. For starters, I know everyone is going to be talking about what's inside of E750 until Season 3 comes out, and in my opinion, that's actually a much cooler plot point to tease for Season 3 when compared to what cliffhanger they left us with in the first season. But I do think Season 1 actually ended somewhat better in comparison as well. Another new bit of info happened to be the late arrival of a trio of dinosaur hunters that I totally did not expect to see in the show at all. And personally, this was one of my favorite aspects about Season 2. If I had to pick an immediate highlight scene from the new season, I'd have to go with the moment where Darius walks into the poacher's tent and finds the severed head of a Sinoceratops sitting hidden underneath an unsuspecting sheet. And then adding into that reveal with the following arrival of Mitch into the tent to talk to Darius about their group's plan to hunt and kill some of the abandoned animals on the island. Well, I just personally, I liked all of that stuff. There's something really fun about the idea of a trio of dinosaur poachers that have snuck their way onto the island in order to illegally bag some trophies before anyone comes back that I thought sat very well within the Jurassic Park universe. I do wish that they'd explored more of that ethical questioning on the side of Darius, especially after Mitch attempted to persuade him to their plan by saying this was the only way these animals would be preserved for the future, but in the end I think they all wound up being great additions to the lore. I especially liked what they did with Mitch and Tiff. In my non-spoiler review, I mentioned that my heart kind of skipped a beat for a second when the show reveals a few silhouettes that look like familiar characters for a brief moment. And it was their introduction that I was obviously talking about. Seeing the three of them get stumbled upon by the kids and having them turn around and look nearly identical to Alan Grant, Ellie Sattler, and even a classic Hunter character like Robert Muldoon got me really, really good. And it's something of another highlight that I'm taking away from this season. I just can't wait to see Dominion now that I've seen that little tease. The decision to have the T-Rex be front and center of the first episode is also something that I think proved to be a very good idea. Having her begin to build a more comfortable, I guess, nesting site right on Main Street meant that the kids couldn't hang out there too long before they ran into serious danger. So that was a good idea. I also like how they actually showed the kids trying to salvage some of the park food in these scenes as well, because realistically, I do think this is something that they do had they really gotten stranded on the island. But with the power out, there's no real way to cook anything outside of a fire, and that would also mean that air conditioning would be non-existent outside of Dr. Wu's little lab that we will, of course, get into later on. I do wish that they'd at least tried to show the kids using the hotels for a brief moment, but as someone who has cleaned out abandoned houses and apartments before in my past, I know that the smell of rotting food in refrigerators and especially the lack of AC would be kind of terrible to deal with in real life, so I get why it wouldn't really be a place they'd like to stay for too long, especially on a tropical island, which would amplify all the problems, but I still wish they'd at least tried to go inside one of the hotels. Another standout moment of the show is one that I've seen a lot of fans talking about, and that happens to be the scene where Tiff shoots and kills Grimm, one of the Baryonyx that lives within a pack-like family on the island. I really do respect the writer's decision to actually have a human kill one of the dinosaurs, and it's a little moment that I think strengthens the ending when the two remaining animals jump onto her boat and kill her as she's trying to get away. That's classic Jurassic karma in the vein of Peter Ludlow from The Lost World that I think always works out well in the film series, and it wound up being very satisfying for me here as well. Also, Rexy, the T-Rex, as she's now officially named, happened to get her third confirmed human kill this season. I don't really count Billy from the game because because that's soft cannon. But after he eats Mitch once he'd been caught in that small trap, I just loved all of that. Everything to do with the bad guys getting their comeuppance, I honestly found to be very, very fun. 
Now, when we actually go to see what's causing these flowers that Brooklyn has found to freeze towards the middle of the show, I thought the idea of Wu having a small location with backup generators was an extremely good idea that paves the way for a lot of cool stuff to be explored in the future. Also, the key card usage in these episodes totally reminds me of Trespasser, and I think the building they find the motorcycle in was even designed in reference to the lab level of that game, so that's another bonus I have to commend them for. Now, as far as E750 goes, Goes. This is where things get interesting, because they're obviously setting this up for a big reveal in Season 3, and I personally think it's going to be one of the hybrids Dr. Wu had on display in his lab in the first Jurassic World, but I don't want to spend too much time talking about that until I release my dedicated video on what's in this glass in the future. The ramifications of Wu's little side project being tied into Manticore or some other genetics companies while the work is still being done by InGen, I also found that to be very interesting as well. And I have no doubt this little nugget of info will tie into Jurassic World Dominion by the time everything is said and done. There's also the novel lore that is finally making its way into the film canon, with Camp Cretaceous asserting that compies actually have trace amounts of venom in their bites, which gives us a better idea on how Dieter Stark managed to get overpowered by these little guys in the Lost World. Now, some of the other elements of new lore didn't work out quite as well for me, such as the shedding of stegosaurus plates like deer antlers. Paleontologically speaking, that little bit of info felt very strange to me, and I think it kind of stretches the believability of the animals much more than I'd like. It was actually something that I immediately googled to figure out whether or not it had any basis in real science. One thing that I definitely think people shouldn't take for granted is the usage of the T-Rex in these episodes, especially the very last one. There's just something incredibly satisfying for me to see a ton of the Isla Nublar species running in fear away from that big giant murder bird while she's roaring up a hill. That I think feels both perfectly iconic and fun for a Jurassic Park cartoon, but also super authentic to the power and threat of the ruler of that island. For an animated series set right after the events of Jurassic World, this just works really well for me, and I can see why it's been getting a really strong reception from audiences right out of the gate. A lot of what people love in the movies is truly on display here, and I think it's proven itself to be a big winner for fans everywhere. Okay, so now for some of the things I didn't really like. I think ultimately, one of the reasons I felt season two wasn't really on par with season one was due to the action set pieces getting really, really over the top as the show went on. The two instances I mentioned in my non-spoiler review as being insane are the moment Ben goes up against the Carnotaurus with a spear, and then later when Hap commits suicide by jumping off of the bike and taking on three Baryonyx by himself. That, in my opinion, was not really telegraphed to the audience at all, and when it happened, I just kind of sat there staring at the screen in disbelief as to what I was seeing. I was still under the impression that this guy could have turned on the kids at any given point in time, so watching him just suddenly turn into a heroic character really left a jarring impression on me. I mean, he's just like, you kids live a long life, and <laughs> he jumps off this thing <laughs> like Joe Exotic in a Jurassic Park show. It, I, it was way over the top for me. But that's totally overshadowed by Ben's battle with Toro, in my opinion. When this started to play out on screen, I just kind of felt like like the show had gone off the rails and suddenly turned into a tribute to 1 million years BC, only in a very random and kind of nonsensical way. I think the reason scenes like this feel so off is because when you compare this to something that happens in one of the actual films, it kind of totally takes the wind out of its sails and makes it feel like it's in a different universe. For example, when Owen Grady is confronted by a Carnotaurus in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, the tone is considerably more dangerous, and as a dinosaur handler himself, he starts to back away and you can see the actual fear and tension in his eyes because he knows exactly what kind of danger he's up against. But when you have a teenager go Conan the Barbarian on the same kind of dinosaur, with nothing to fight with but a stick, it just kind of lost me there. Seeing Ben actively going into battle and confronting a dinosaur that he knows can kill and eat him, it didn't make him look very smart to me either. I think if they had constructed the scene in a way where we saw Ben overpower and defeat the Carnotaurus by using his wits and making the dinosaur possibly fall off the cliff on his own in a manner similar to the ending of Tremors, for example, I would have bought it way more, but 
As it stands, it just feels like they tried to cross a bridge a little too far for me. Now, the reason I think it's kind of important to make my little complaints clear in this review is because I see a lot of potential in Camp Cretaceous. Season 1 did such a good job at telling an animated Jurassic World story over the course of 8 episodes that came complete with hearts, ingenuity, and fun. Season 2 I definitely think tried to go for the same thing and it accomplished a lot, but in the end I do think that some of these more wild and crazy ideas probably should have been swapped out for something a little less grandiose. And I say this as someone who really loves the Jurassic Park franchise, yet also someone who's totally aware of all the weird things that they've done before in the past. I think one of the things that sets my viewpoint apart from a lot of other people on YouTube is that I don't really think the original film is untouchable and not allowed to be criticized, despite the fact that I openly love the movie and think it's by far the best in the series. Nonsensical things can and have happened in this franchise before, of course, but when it comes to a scene like Ben versus the Carno, I think it crossed into the raptor gymnastics territory for me more than really any Anything else that I've seen so far in the 16 episodes that they've released. Jurassic Park as a movie series isn't exactly hardcore in its depiction of realism. If you take the very first scene in the very first movie at face value, for example, the entire logic of Muldoon's operation to move the Velociraptor into the holding pen kind of makes zero sense on a realistic level. I mean, you've got all of these guys with multiple different firearms for transporting this animal into a new paddock, but literally none of them have a tranquilizer gun, and for some reason the dinosaur is being moved while it's fully awake? I just keep hearing Sarah Harding's words of why the hell wasn't it tranquilized from the Lost World whenever I watch that scene these days. Especially due to the fact that the veterinarian in Jurassic Park actually mentions that Muldoon Trank the Triceratops in a later scene. So why wouldn't a single person think to do that to the most dangerous species in the park during the opening? Like I said, silly or unrealistic stuff has happened in the franchise before, and while I'm always aware of it, I still think that there's a fine line you can cross if you're not too careful. And having been openly attacking, honestly bully a full-grown Carnotaurus is one of them. No joke, I kind of feel bad for the dinosaur now. That kid really kicked its butt. I guess what I'm saying here is the believability of scenes like that are a little harder for me to swallow because I know that they're in the same universe as the films. I get that it's a cartoon and that they're showing Ben grow as a character here. They've set up Bumpy's growth in the first season, so when he runs up on Toro and starts to fight alongside Ben, fully grown, I can see how it lines up with what they've already established. But I do think the actual time of how long it's been since that little dino ran away before he came back wasn't very clear either. Again, bringing up Fallen Kingdom, the scene in which they set up the Chekhov's gun of the tranquilizer liquid being lethal enough to put Blue into respiratory failure, that got paid off after Wheatley decided to shoot Owen with it later on. And of course, there's that shot of Zia freaking out and pulling the dart out of him to show us that not all of the liquid went into his system. Owen Grady's character here also gets upset and angry at Ken for shooting the one animal that he'd come to the island to save. He literally told him to wait for his signal to follow the plan. They didn't do it, and because of that, a man is dead and his entire motivation for going to Isla Nublar may die as well. So there's a lot of plot and character stuff here that works, in my opinion. I'm not going to go too much further into this because I think I've already gotten my point across, but I just want you guys to know Ben's radical attack on Toro doesn't feel as strong or believable to me as some of the other stuff I've seen done in these movies. Of course, I do recognize it's a cartoon. I get that. Kids are going to love it, but I still think it could have been a little less over the top. Overall, Season 2 of Camp Cretaceous, I think, is a very fun Jurassic Park animated series, but it's also one that I think could have been just a tad bit more realistic when compared to its film counterparts. Like I said before, I recognize these movies aren't exactly trying to be paleo documentaries or even a real-world representation of physics, but I do think that having a boy fight a carno with a stick was kind of over the top. I'm super excited to see what E750 turns out to be. I like the usage of dinosaur behavior, and I was really into the new villains as well. Mitch and Tiff got what they deserved, and it was super fun to watch on screen. Maybe next season we can see some more of the Allosaurus, Nasutoceratops, or even the Troodons that they've teased us with in the live tour. So for all of that stuff, I'm really excited. Anyways guys, these are all just my own thoughts on the subject matter. What did all of you think of Season 2 of Camp Cretaceous, and what is your favorite scene in the show so far? Now, whatever your own thoughts and opinions happen to be, I'd love to hear them in the comments down below.
Now before I go, I'd like to thank all of my game wardens, as well as all of my engine executives. I'd also like to thank all of my park workers and engine hunters as well. Guys, it seriously means the world to me that you all continue to support what I do, and I never want you to ever forget that. Now, I'd like to thank you all for watching today's video, and hope you all enjoyed the content. If you feel like I deserve it, I'd appreciate the like and hope that you'll consider subscribing if you're interested in hearing from me again. I'll see you all in the next video, guys, and as always, take it easy.